Um, again, I'm Dr. Heidi Klesig. I, um, I'm a retired pain management specialist. I only, I did train in anesthesia, and that's going to be a key part of what I tell you about today. But I only practiced anesthesia one year, and then I, I missed talking to my patients. I, you know, they were all asleep. So I went, in, <laughs> I went into pain management because I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy the personal interaction. And I'm, so I'm glad to have you all here today. I'm glad to speak to you about some of the important information, especially as currently the, the Uniform Law Commission is considering changing the standards for death determination in the entire United States. And it's something that you should be aware of. Um, people ask me, why did you write a science book from a Christian perspective? And the reason is that science, which, you know, I, I'm a science geek, I love studying science. Science tells us a lot about how things work. It does not tell us what is right and wrong. And so we need to look at science with an ethical framework. And that's why we wrote this book from a Christian perspective. Uh, but honestly, I think even if you're not a Christian, even if your family members or friends that you want to share this information with are not Christians, I think anyone with a conscience can see that some of the practices that are going on today in association with organ donation are not ethical, right? Now, I am going, because you know I'm from Wisconsin, I come here once a year, I'm going to just dump the whole load on you today. I'm going to give it to you with a fire hose. And it's going to seem like a lot, especially if you haven't really thought about these things before. So what I recommend is that, you know, just sit back, take it all in, think about it. After I'm done, there will be time for, for questions. And oh, and, and Genevieve's holding up. I have a, a review. I don't know if any of you have heard of G3 Ministries, but they asked me to write a short review of this topic. And Genevieve has kindly printed those out so you can have that short review. I have books on the table uh, that you can purchase. Our, our purchase price at conferences is $10. Otherwise, the book is available for, I think, about $16 on Amazon. And uh, I have a website. It's respectforhumanlife.com. Be sure to put the human in there because respectforlife.com is not the right site. Respectforhumanlife.com. And my card, if you don't want to write all that down with the website information, is also back there. This after you've heard all this talk and you're like, what, what was that about again? You can go to the website. Um, they have, we have a survivor's page showing pictures and stories of people who were diagnosed brain dead and lived to tell the tale. Some of them are living a perfectly normal life today. Um, we have information about the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act the Uniform Determination of Death Act, all the statutes. We have a, a blog post about the revisions being proposed, so there's a lot that you can study. But I am so glad you're here because we have, I tell people we have the goods on this topic. We just need more distribution. And so you're my distribution. As you learn about this and talk to your families and they talk to their families and friends, this is how the word's going to get out. <laughs> Door to right to life, right? I'm not going to tell anything new to you here with this. This is preaching to the choir. Uh, we, we espouse a pro-life to the end of life view, right? We want to be pro-life from conception, fertilization, right, until the final breath. So you wouldn't be surprised if I told you, well, here's a person, right? The, the fertilized egg, given the breath of life by God. This is a person. So I'm, now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum. And I'm going to say, this is a person. And you're saying, Dr. Klesig, of course that's a person. Look, he's, he's got monitors. He's got, he's pink. I mean, he's, he's, you can see this guy's alive. He's a person. But would it surprise you to know that there are people who look exactly like this in ICUs around the country and around the world right now? And their doctors have declared them legally dead. That person right now, they could come and ask you. Your, your loved one is legally dead, and they might ask you to have permission to take his organs, to remove that beating heart. That's the end of the spectrum that I'm talking to you about. What I want to get perfectly clear is that organ donors are biologically alive. Their spirits have not yet departed their bodies, and removing their organs is an act of murder. They are not biologically dead, they are only legally being declared dead. 
So to make this real simple, we have a, a kind of an easy way for you to help, help you kind of wrap your mind around this. Organs, unlike tissues, can only be harvested from a living donor. Now, most of us who have been to high school in America kind of have an idea what an internal organ is, right? An organ is something like your heart, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys. Um, these things, as soon as circulation stops, rapidly begin to break down and decompose and become unsuitable for transplant. Um, tissues, now when a doctor says tissues, this isn't puffs and Kleenex, right? Tissues are simple structures like our skin, our bones, our corneas, and our eyes. These things are much more resilient to a loss of blood flow. So a, someone who is all dead, a corpse in the morgue, can donate skin, bone, corneas, those things. So the difference is, when I'm talking about this, I'm going to be talking about the difference between organs, heart, lung, liver, kidneys, and tissues. And that distinction will make this a lot easier to understand. So again, organs, unlike tissues, can only be harvested from a living donor because they break down so quickly once that blood flow stops. So, you know, now that I've made such an assertion, right, can I back it up? How would I back that up to you? So I'm saying that organ donors have to be alive, dead people can't donate organs. Have you ever wondered why is there a donor waiting list, right? Let's just, these are, these are quick numbers, right? This is from 2021 U.S. Health and Human Services data, and 2022 is very similar. But just in round figures, if you calculate the death rate in America, we calculate, they know about how many organ donors have registered to donate, and we can find out that in 2021, about one and a half million registered organ donors died. And there were only 100,000 people on the waiting list, right? You know, if dead people could donate organs, we should have more than enough, right? If you do the math, if every organ donor could donate one organ, if you take one and a half million dead registered organ donors, 100,000 in need of a transplant, that would be 15 organs for everyone, right? If a dead person could donate an organ, right? But, you know, it gets worse. Um, according to organdonor.gov, every organ donor can donate up to eight organs. That would be 120 organs for everybody, right? If dead people could donate organs. So obviously, dead people cannot donate organs and we'd have a tremendous surplus. So why is there a transplant waiting list? According to organdonor.gov, only three to thousand people die in such a way as to allow for deceased organ donation. Well, what's this new way of dying, right? What is this special way of dying that only three to thousand can donate organs? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so the definition of death changed in 1968. This is the landmark article in the Journal of the American Medical Association. A definition of irreversible coma. What they propose in this article would be, why don't we just redefine people in a coma as dead? Now, why would they do that, right? Well, I'll tell you a little background of the story. In 1968, on New Year's Day, in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, a young black man was picnicking with his family and suffered a brain bleed. And he was rushed to the hospital in Cape Town. He was admitted under the care of a Dr. Hoffenberg. Well, Dr. Hoffenberg that night was approached by Dr. Christian Barnard, whose name you may have heard, and the transplant team. And they said to Dr. Hoffenberg, we'd like you to declare Mr. Clive Hope was the name of that young man. We'd like you to declare Mr. Hope dead. Well, at first, Mr. Hoff Dr. Hoffenberg refused. You know, how can I declare someone dead with a beating heart? I mean, the man's not dead. Well, they must have applied a lot of pressure overnight because the next morning, Dr. Hoffenberg did declare Clive Hall, a young man who'd had a brain bleed, beating heart, breathing, probably on a ventilator, but breathing, that he declared him dead. And so that, that morning, Dr. Christian Bernard took Mr. Hall to the operating room, removed his beating heart, put it in a retired white dentist as the first successful heart transplant. So doctors around the world took notice. They found, they found this very interesting. They said, you know, to make this heart transplant thing work, we need a very fresh, very viable organ. 
we need to have people with beating hearts declared dead. But they knew they were on shaky ground, ethically and morally, right? So this article that you see here came out eight months later, where they proposed, let's redefine people in an irreversible coma as dead. They had no tests, randomized control studies. They had no evidence that people in a coma were dead. This was a utilitarian pronouncement to allow organ harvest to proceed. And in 1981, the recommendation of the Harvard Medical School Ad Hoc Committee was codified into law. Every state uh, in our nation has a version of this law in the books right now. And this is how they define death in America today. Uh, I'm going to refer to it as the UDDA, which is the Uniform Determination of Death Act. But when I, in, as I move along, if I say UDDA, this is what I'm talking about. So they have two ways of declaring you that you are dead. One is the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, your heart and lungs have stopped. Or two, the irreversible cessation of the functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. You know, and that, on the face of it, that doesn't sound too unreasonable, does it? But as we gonna go forward, I'm gonna show you the devil is in the details. How irreversible are these things really? All right, the UDBA has been controversial. There have been three presidential councils since 1981 appointed to study it. And right now, the Uniform Law Commission is studying another revision. In 2018, the Harvard Medical School, I don't know if I'm able to, can I laser point on this? No, I guess I can't. The uh, Harvard Medical School held a conference defining death, organ transplantation, and the 50-year legacy of the Harvard Report on Brain Death. So, the people that started all this in 1968 reviewed 50 years later, you know, how is this going? How's this redefinition turning out? It's a, it was a wonderfully interesting conference. Here's, here's a quote. The UDDA is best used as a legal instrument to represent death in the United States, not as a way to define death as a biological occurrence. So the, the doctors, ethicists, and scientists 50 years later admitted you are not biologically dead under the UDDA. You've only been declared legally dead. Your rights as a human being have been withdrawn legally, though you are biologically still alive. Again, legally dead, biologically alive. Here's another quote from the 2018 50-year conference. It's long, but I want you to, I want you to hear it. Um, this is from a, a moral philosopher and bioethicist. Policymaking becomes indoctrination whenever public opinions and preferences are intentionally manipulated in ways that destroy or prevent citizens' independent judgment and rational deliberation. The history of death determination in the context of organ donation can be described as an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. Right? Give the gift of life. Be altruistic. We're all in this together. These are indoctrinating attempts to settle a moral controversy. And so when you're down at the DMV and you see those pretty colored posters, you know, be an organ donor, I want you to think an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. Uh, this is a book <coughs> written by Drs. Franklin Miller and Robert Truog. They were also keynote speakers at the 50-year Harvard conference. They wrote a whole book, and you can buy this book on Amazon. It makes horrifying reading because they do want to be more honest with the public to their credit. They want to tell people, honestly, these people are not actually dead. But because these doctors are still very interested in obtaining your organs, their, their solution to this sticky wicket is they propose changing our uh, medical ethics at the end of life so that we all say, well, yeah, it's okay to harvest organs from people who are still alive. So, I'm going to now go through some of the different kinds of transplant. And again, I'm not here to say that all transplant is wrong. Some of it is wonderful, ethical, altruistic, act of Christian charity. But there are problems that you need to be aware of, and that's, that's the next part of the talk. So I'm going to start out with living donation. So living donation is the happy story of, of transplant, right? These people... The, both the donor and the recipient remain alive after the procedure. 
And we think about this, you know, hear about living related donation. We have a mother in our community who donated a kidney to her daughter. I mean, what a beautiful thing. Um, but you do not always have to be related. People who are from different families, different backgrounds, sometimes are similar enough to be able to make a donation and both remain alive. And since we're here in the Atlanta area, I thought you'd be interested in the, this story. Maybe you saw this in your newspapers. Uh, these ladies work in an Atlanta healthcare facility. Each of them had a husband who needed a kidney transplant. But sadly, each wife was not a suitable donor. But when they found this out, they tested for each other's husband and each lady could donate to the other lady's husband. <laughs> So, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. It's a happy story. That was March of 2021. Each donated a kidney that was successfully implanted in the other one's spouse. Um, you may have done some living donation without really thinking about it. If you're a blood donor, you know, giving blood, you can give bone marrow, skin, you can give stem cells from a placenta, you can give one of a pair of organs, the kidney being, you know, the most common uh, example of that. You can give part of a lobed organ, such as a liver, and both people remain alive. So in addition to being a wonderful example of selfless service, living donations are actually the most successful. And the reason that is, is that, say in the example of our mother-daughter team back home, they brought them both down to the OR, put them both to sleep, took the kidney out of the mother, the mother says, and they carried it like a baby over <laughs> to my daughter, and then they put it in the daughter. There was very little time that that kidney was ever disconnected from, from blood flow, and it never had to be cooled down and put on ice. I mean, it was very well cared for, and so that, that gals had that kidney over 20 years. So, moving on, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about what I call morgue donation. That's not a term. That's a term I made up, honestly. But I wanted to, to use that term to be very clear. These people are all dead. These are cold, gray, stiff. Their spirit has departed back to the Lord who gave it. These people are all dead, right? And again, I mentioned earlier, we can't take their organs. Their organs have already become unsuitable for transplant. But their tissues, things like corneas, skin, bones, heart valves, all these things tolerate lack of blood flow. And they can be ethically, morally, wonderfully donated from a biologically dead corpse, okay? Again, these people cannot donate whole organs, but the tissues, yes. Now, when Chris Bogosh and I wrote our book, we had no idea that there could be any problem with this. How could anything go wrong? You're all dead, you wanna give some tissues? Sounds fine to me, right? Well, we were surprised uh, by this LA Times article as we were researching. In the rush to harvest body parts, death investigations have been upended. And the reporter, Melody Peterson, reported in 2019, the problem that they had found, she found over two dozen cases in the state of California where the organ procurement organization got first dibs on the body before the coroner or medical examiner could look at it. So there were cases where the body the dead body had been so biologically torn apart and you know, destroyed that there wasn't enough left for the medical examiner to make a call as to what was the cause of death or whether the death was due to a crime. And it left these families without closure. So this was a surprise to us. So there are some difficulties even with donating a dead body. This is one that we talk about in our book. Um, this is John Flath. Uh, he was 18 years old. You can see he's a, an ROTC, healthy athlete. You know, he just sat down and died in, in 2011 while working out with the cadets. And, you know, this is 2011. This was before people were falling over dead all the time, right? So it's, back then it was still surprising when a young man fell over dead like this. Well, he had signed a donor card. And because he was 18 and had signed a donor card, his parents could not stop the donation. And uh, One Legacy, which is a private company, an organ procurement organization in California, took John's heart valves to be sold as medical devices. And by the time the medical examiner got a chance to look at him, there was not enough heart left to be able to answer his family's questions. Why did my young son die? 
This was, um, if any of you are Major League Baseball fans, this is Christy Rettenman, her, her father, I'm, I'm not a baseball fan, but I'm told he was a fairly famous uh, baseball player and coach, Merv Rettenman. She died in the hospital in 2013. She had been admitted after suffering apparent violence and died of her wound. She looked pretty badly beat up. Um, her boyfriend had had previous arrests for domestic abuse. Uh, but because she had signed an organ donor card, uh, her tissues, bones, long bones, skin, heart belt, so much tissue was removed that by the time the coroner could look at her, he couldn't tell if her death was the result of being beaten or if her body has been just so damaged by the procurement. So Mr. and Mrs. Rettenman were not able to have justice served in the case of their daughter's apparent murder at the hands of her boyfriend. Well, why are organ procurement organizations in such a hurry, right? Why, why the rush? Well, they say follow the money, right? And so here, you know, this is, this is a, from the LA Times article. This is just the, what you get for tissues. And from what you can see on the screen here, I'll kind of point out, this one's interesting. For skin, for a piece, this should say about an eight by 10 inch square. So a piece of skin about the size of a piece of typing paper, they get $16,500. And for, you know, if some of you have had uh, back fusion surgery and they use, you know, bone graft, I mean, it's an ethical thing to take. You can take that. Those are generally from, you know, deceased organ donor. For back surgery, they get $2,550 for a teaspoon, right? So this is big money. And this is just the tissue. I mean, if this were um, a body that was intact, at a beating heart, and you're going to take the lung, liver, and kidneys, you can make up to $5 million. Now, of course, they can't sell it, right? This is just processing fees, right, and, and, and procurement costs. So this is what the, the organ procurement organization ends up making from your, the body you gave away for free, right? So that, that's why they're in such a hurry. I'm going to talk just briefly about these next two. Uh, forced organ harvest, you may have heard about. This is going on in communist China presently. Uh, this graphic is from a documentary film directed by Leon Li, where uh, he went in and interviewed people from Taiwan who went to communist China to get an organ and only later found out that those organs are coming from prisoners. So if you are arrested uh, in China, and particularly vulnerable have been people of the Falun Gong religion, which is a religion of meditation and peace. Uh, the Uyghur Muslims have been very much in the news, and, and their organs are in demand because being Muslim, their organs are untainted by pork or alcohol. So people from the Saudi company, countries are very interested in those organs. And now house church Christians are also being targeted. So when you're arrested, they, are, they force you to undergo blood and tissue typing. And then you are considered as an organ donor as part of your execution. Sadly, <clears throat> the United States still permits insurance companies to pay for Chinese organs. Uh, there are countries where this has been banned, uh, places such as uh, Israel, Spain, Italy, Taiwan, Norway, and Belgium. I heard how this was banned in Israel. It's kind of an interesting story. An Israeli doctor had a patient come, and the patient said, Doc, I need a pre-op physical. I'm going to China to get my transplant. It's scheduled to take place on such and such a day. And the doctor said, wait a minute. How can you schedule a transplant? How do you know that a suitable donor will be available? Well, in China, they know they're available. They're locked up over there. They're ready to go. They bring the transplant tourists in, and that's the day that person gets executed with organ transplant, the meat. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink here. <clears throat> These are some ladies. This is the 23rd anniversary of their protest march. These are Falun Gong practitioners that live in Flushing, New York. They have not given up on protesting this, and so neither should we. Amen. Uh, Ms. Flutter was talking about how she um, follows the United Nations. The UN actually did a good thing uh, last fall. The U.S. proposed that the United Nations investigate the situation of the Uyghur Muslims in China. But China, having more political clout over time, was able to pressure a majority of nations to vote this down, including getting Brazil and India to abstain from the vote. All right, moving on, I'm going to talk just quickly about organ trafficking. Organ trafficking is a selling of an organ. Uh, the only country where actually you're allowed to sell your organ is Iran. 
built for whatever reason around allows people to you know go out there and shock their organs i guess but this is a, an article from the guardian i've already sold my daughters now my kidney winter in afghanistan slums so organ traffickers will approach someone in poverty and offer you know a paltry sum you know a thousand dollars sounds like a lot at first uh, to give your kidney um, and we said, you know, we live in a, a capitalist country. We might say, well, you know, what's wrong with, with selling your, your organ? Well, I'm here to tell you, taking a kidney involves major surgery. Uh, the mother-daughter team from our community that I told you about, the mother had big time complications after that surgery that required hospitalization and time to fix. And I do not think that these people in impoverished countries would get that level of care. I think a lot of these people end up dead or disabled. Um, I would like to say that organ trafficking does not happen in the United States, but there are traffickers even here that will sign you up with your new best friend for consideration, right? If you will pay this person, they'll come in and tell the hospital, yeah, we're best friends and I want to give my kidney away. And the hospitals don't really investigate very closely when that happens. So it's not common here, but it does happen here. Uh, this was just last Tuesday. Um, a, a Nigerian senator and his wife were taken to court in England and accused of organ uh, trafficking, is what this was. They had come from Nigeria with their daughter, who re requires a, a kidney transplant, and they had brought a 21-year-old man along from Nigeria to be her donor. Once he got to England, he escaped from the couple and found the police and said, they brought me here against my will. I don't want to give my kidney. And so now these people were arrested and they are, they are on trial currently in England about this. So this is, this is the ugly face of organ trafficking. Okay, I'm going to talk about donation after brain death. And this one is kind of personal to me. So this is the hard part of the talk. When I was in training at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the late 80s, uh, they, I came in for a night call and they said, yeah, Heidi, uh, uh, go up to ICU. We've got a, a young man that you know, we're going to do an organ harvest on tonight. Go get him ready. So, you know, oh, gosh, I knew that was, sort of, that was sort of new to me. I'd never done anything like that. So I asked my attending, I said, you know, I don't want to look stupid, but an organ donor. Well, is there anything different that I need to know? And he kind of laughed, you know, he says, well, just be sure they've declared him brain dead. That transplant team can be a little eager. Like, oh, okay. So I went up to the ICU and I saw someone who looked, he looked a lot like this. He was about my age. He'd been in a motorcycle accident. Uh, he had a head injury and the neurologist had, had checked him over and declared him brain dead. And I went to look at him. You know, he was warm. He was breathing. I mean, with a ventilator, he was breathing. I put my stethoscope on his chest and listened to his heart. You know, I looked, looked him up and down. I was really kind of grateful his family wasn't in the room. Because usually when we come and evaluate you for anesthesia, we're trying to tell you how we're going to take good care of you, everything's going to be fine. You know, and what would I have said to his family when you're not bringing him back, right? I, mean, I was sort of in a, a little bit of a, a daze over this. This seemed very odd to me at the time. So I took him down to the operating room. Again, he looked just like every other ICU patient I had worked with. I, we put him on the table. Um, my, a supervising attending, I said, well, you know, what should we do? I mean, should we give him the usual anesthetic? And I said, you know, if he's dead, we could just give him, you know, a little narcotic and, and, and a little paralyzing agent. He says, no, you've got to give him something to depress consciousness. And I said, well, oh if he's dead, why do we need to do that? And he just kind of looked at me and he goes, just in case. <sighs> okay. So, you know, I'll tell you what, we started surgery. He reacted to incision. He reacted to the, the bone saw to cut up open his sternum just like any other patient, right? And at one point I was, you know, I was giving him the narcotic, but his heart rate wasn't coming down. So I gave him a little bit more um, midazolam or Versed. If you're a nurse or a doctor, you know that that's something that cuts consciousness. As soon as I gave the consciousness cutting drug, his heart rate came down. So I'll tell you, you know, this man was biologically and spiritually still alive. And I am culpable for participating in his murder by removal of his organ. And if there was not a forgiving God who died in our place on Calvary, 
if the blood of Christ was not available? How could I live with myself? How could I speak to you today? You know, I am, I'm going to take that memory with me to the grave. But the least I can do is to tell you two things. Brain dead organ donors are not dead. Their spirits are still in their bodies. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Those are the two things I want you to walk, walk out with today. Because, you know, as, you, as I mentioned, these practices have been going on for 50 or more years. So I'm sure it may be even in this room, there's someone who was a healthcare professional. There was someone who received an organ. There is someone maybe who gave a family member to be harvested. There is forgiveness and reconciliation in Christ Jesus for all of that. We need to get the truth out, but we need to speak that truth in love. Amen. So just to tell you, you know, brain death, you would think that it would take a lot of fancy tests. No. Um, all it takes is a bedside physical exam. You probably have at home in your kitchen enough equipment to declare someone brain dead, right? So again, I, if I wanted to declare someone brain dead, pretty much I would stick a cotton swab in your eye to see if you blinked. I'd pinch your nail bed to see if you moved your hand. I'd, I'd shoot some cold water in your ears to see if your eyes reacted and got dizzy from, from that. Uh, and then we'd disconnect your ventilator and see if you breathe, right? And if you don't react to those things, you can be declared bio, uh, legally dead, though you're not biologically dead. They removed the requirement for a brainwave test in 1971 because a lot of these people still have brainwaves. So really, when they test for these things, they're really just testing the brain stem reflexes, and if those aren't working, they just assume there's nothing going on up here and they ignore your beating heart, right? But honestly, do you see a brain here? Having a brain, is that a requirement to be a person? Not if we're consistent in our pro-life view. I mean, these people, little people, don't even have a brain and we think they're humans. This is um, Zach Dunlap. He's from Oklahoma. He was, uh, in 2007, he had a head injury after a, a four-wheel ATV type accident, and he was taken to the hospital. He was pronounced brain dead, according to the bedside test that I just told you about. But, you know, he's a young man. They wanted to go the extra mile. They did a cerebral perfusion scan to see if he had blood flow to his brain. And so the radiologist looked at it and said, nope, no blood flow going to his brain. So the doctors went to talk to Zach's parents, right? And interestingly, Zach could hear every word. So Zach's laying there and he says then in a later interview, the next thing I remember, I was laying in the hospital bed, not being able to move. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do anything. I'm on a ventilator. I heard someone say, I'm sorry, he's brain dead. He's passing away. And there's nothing I could do. I just get mad. I couldn't do anything to sign at all. I tried to scream, tried to move. Just got extremely angry. Okay? So a couple of things. Even a cerebral perfusion scan, it's not sensitive enough. I mean, he obviously <clears throat> had flow, enough flow to his brain to be able to listen to that conversation, right? The bedside exam said he's brain dead, but his brain is obviously working. They're not testing his thinking. They're just testing a few reflexes. So thankfully for Zach, one of his cousins was a nurse and didn't believe he was dead either and went in and, and took out his clasp knife and, and dug down on his toenail and Zach moved his <laughs> foot, thank the Lord, right? And stopped the whole process from becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? So praise the Lord. Uh, we have a, if you go to our website, we have a survivor's page with about a dozen people like this. You can read their stories. Maybe last summer you remember the death of actress Ann Hesch, this is sort of interesting. She um, she had a car accident on August 6th, where when the first responders arrived, she was awake and talking. By August 11th, though, she was declared brain dead by her doctors. But because she was a registered organ donor, they kept her alive while dead until August 14th, when they harvested her organs. And this ended up being kind of an interesting uh, news cycle thing because in the state of California, when you're brain dead, you are legally dead. So the LA Times published her obituary August 11th. 
Now, I don't get to agree with the New York Times and Washington Post very often, but <laughs> the New York Times and Washington Post refused to publish her obituary until her actual death by organ harvesting, right? And so this kind of interesting that it, it led to a lot of controversy in the news and the, the obituary editor you know, for the Washington Post says it's black and white. If there's no gray area here, if you're on life support, you're still alive. Other papers can do what they want. For me, I only publish when they're really dead. How about that? Yeah, I mean, the band is right. And the reason that that, that comes up is there are many people that in between being declared brain dead and the time of the organ harvest do manage to wake up. And, and I'm sure he's seen that happen. So he's not in a hurry to make his paper look stupid by you know, jumping the gun and publishing these things. Uh, Dr. Alan Schumann, uh, he's a pediatric neurologist uh, at UCLA Medical School. He has 175 cases of brain dead people who live after being declared dead under the UDDA, some for more than 20 years. He was part of the uh, 2018 Harvard Conference as well and spoke on these things. He says that after an injury, the brain enters sort of a shock-like state, but if given enough time, the brain can <clears throat> often make an amazing recovery. But he's troubled that once you're declared brain dead, um, you're taken for harvest, and it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Here's one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Dr. Schumann. He wrote, just as cigarette ads are required to contain a footnote warning of health risks, as promoting organ donation should contain a footnote along these lines, warning, it remains controversial whether you'll be actually dead at the time of the removal of your organ. All right, the other way under the UDD I mentioned, besides being declared uh, brain dead, you could be declared dead after circulatory death, and that's the last on our list here. So in the 1990s, you know, they're always looking for more organs, right? There's always a, like, you gotta get more organs. So they discovered this new donor pool. These people are not brain dead, but neither are they really expected to survive. So uh, their families are approached and they say, you know, could we withdraw their care in a way that allows their organs to be harvested, right? Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, there's a vast, vast difference. If you have a loved one in the ICU who you know, is, is not gonna make it, Hold them in your arms. Tell them you love them. Sing to them. It's all right to withdraw the care and let them go to heaven. But to send them alone among strangers to be dissected to death, there's a vast difference. And so again, I'm not saying that, that sometimes care is, is at the end of life. None of us are making it out of here alive, right? We all have an expiration date. It's all right to let your loved one go, go to be with the Lord. But do it in, in a family loving way, not this way. So what they do is they take the patient either right to the OR or sometimes a room nearby. The transplant team is scrubbed and ready to go. They remove the ventilator and any drips. They wait till the heart stops beating. And then after a two to five minute wait, they wanna just be sure it's not gonna start again. It's two minutes in Wisconsin, it's five minutes in Canada. I heard they waited a whole 75 seconds for a baby's heart in Denver. Then they declare you dead, right? But I'll tell you, many medical professionals are uncomfortable with this because you know we know that after two to five minutes of cardiac arrest, we routinely resuscitate people, right? I mean, all of you look real good right now, but if God forbid one of you should keel over right this minute, I'm here to tell you it would take us at least minutes to get you you know off your chair laid out assess are you know what's going on are you, are you just having a seizure is your heart beating are you breathing Do, does anyone know is there a defibrillator in the church we'd have to figure that out we have to start some cpr you know if there is a defibrillator we have to go get that equipment it has to go through its checklist if you're a big burly guy we got to shave your chest so the patches stick at least two minutes but you know what if we get that heart jump started and often you know, most of the time we do, and then get you to the hospital and they fix the underlying problem, you, you have an excellent chance of walking out doing just fine. So two to five minutes, if you're capable of being resuscitated, you are not dead. 
And here's a case. This is from my neighboring state of Illinois, pronounced dead twice. What should the attending physician do in between? Um, this was a young lady with Down syndrome. She had had a cerebral aneurysm bleed in her head. She was not brain dead. She did not pass the or fail the test for brain death, but she was not expected to survive. So her family gave permission for her to be taken to the operating room, have her care withdrawn, and donate her organs. Right. So this is a busy slide that. I'll just sort of sum up for you. So she was taken to the, she was taken right to the operating room, put on the table, prepped and draped. They stopped the ventilator, they stopped the drips, and they, her heart stopped. And the physician reached up under the sterile drape. They were just going to take her kidneys, they were not going to take her heart. So he listened, two minutes went by, no, no heartbeat. So they pronounced her dead at 2.59 a.m., right? And they started, started surgery. Well, as they were cutting down to the kidneys in her abdomen, they noticed there were pulses in the descending aorta and in the renal artery. Her heart had restarted, and she started gasping for breath. What did it do now? I mean, out of an act of pure mercy, they gave her you know, some fentanyl and some lorazepam, and, and her heart stopped again. But you know, when the coroner looked at this, I mean, he had no, no choice but to pronounce the second cause of death a homicide. You know, I don't have access to the records in Illinois. I don't know if court case ever came of this, but I'm sure, I hope the family was given justice for this. All right. Well, it gets worse. I'm, I'm sad to tell you there's a new procedure that's even a little more gruesome. So that lady, they were only going to take her kidneys, right? If the donor's heart is to be harvested, there's a new procedure they're doing in America today. What they do is they take you to the operating room, they clamp off the circulation to your brain to make you brain dead on purpose, then they resuscitate the rest of your organs, restarting your heart in your own chest to be sure it's healthy enough before they harvest your heart. Now, I wouldn't believe me if I said that. That's pretty gruesome, but to almost Remind me, this is really true. I have this slide. This is actually the protocol for donation after circulatory death from the University of Nebraska. And again, it's a busy slide. What they do is they open the chest through a standard sternotomy. These people, again, are not brain dead. Then they ligate, that means tie off or put balloons in, the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain to ensure that blood flow to the brain is not reestablished once circulation is restarted. Because if it was, you might wake up. Then what they do is they start cardiopulmonary bypass, and once blood flow to the heart is established, the heart will start beating. Now, remember our definition. We were supposed to have irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function. How irreversible is that if they can restart your heart in your own chest? I think they're playing fast and loose with the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Uh, this procedure is controversial. It has been banned in Australia. The American College of Physicians has recommended that this procedure be paused because they say the burden of proof regarding the ethical and legal propriety of this practice has not been met. Um, Dr. Matthew DeCamp is a bioethicist. He says restarting circulation reverses what was just declared to be irreversible, right? Yet there's three hospitals in America doing this now, one in Nebraska, one in Arizona, one in New York. And they're, according to Dr. Amy Fiedler, who's a cardiothoracic and transplant surgeon, she says people are always asking her, how can we get, us, get this started at our hospital? Uh, I'm going to let Dr. Ari Jaffe uh, kind of finish up this section of the talk. He's a pre pediatrician and critical care specialist in Canada. Uh, he says, I've argued that brain death is not death itself. It leads to death when and only when ventilation is stopped and breathing stops and there's a cardiac arrest and irreversible loss of circulation. This is death. Further, I believe that at two to 10 minutes after loss of circulation, the donation after circulatory death donor is not dead. This is because there's not necessarily irreversible loss of circulation. That is to say that it could still be reversed. When exactly this irreversibility state occurs is an important question. At present, this is not known. 
However, it is known that it is not even at 10 minutes after cardiac arrest. Now, he knows that because he's done a, a case report. He looked at all the medical literature. He found a dozen cases of people who were not even given resuscitation, and their hearts restarted up to 10 minutes after they arrested. And some of them went on to have normal lives. So he is, he's quite correct about this. So he goes on to say, whether I'm challenging the practice of organ donation is another question. The question is not whether organ donors are dead, because they are not. The question is whether organs can be harvested before death from patients whose prognosis is death, and hence be a contributing cause of death. My argument is that this is the current practice, and this is precisely what needs to be debated urgently. Is organ harvesting before death violating respect for persons and using them as means? And I would think we'd have to agree it is. All right, here's the cute little piggy. Xenotransplantation, I'm just going to talk about really quick just because it was in the news last year. Xenotransplantation is taking uh, organs from an, a non-human creature and putting them in a human, right? Uh, historically, these were the first transplants. Back in 1906, uh, a doctor tried to take pig kidneys and goat kidneys and put them in his renal failure patients and you know because they were not compatible they hadn't learned about that yet they, the patients did not survive but um, recently an american patient this was uh, in 2022 david bennett senior became the first person to receive a pig heart that had been genetically modified to be less likely to be rejected he lived about 45 days and he passed away uh, due to complications of a pig virus interestingly that had hitched a ride on his Pig heart. So, I mean, there's some interesting, you know, there's some interesting things to talk about with xenotransplantation, but I'm going to just leave that if you're interested for the Q and A, just in the interest of time. Now, since since I'm a recovering anesthesiologist, I would like to just talk a little bit about anesthesia. Will you receive an anesthetic when you donate your organs after you're supposedly dead? Right. Remembering that the UDDA allows you to be declared legally dead while biologically alive. When you're legally dead, you have no right to autonomy or self-determination. The medical system changes from serving your best interest to serving the best interest of those who receive your organ. And I had an interesting discussion the other night at supper with Ricardo Davis, the president of Georgia Right to Life. His background in medical records, he said at least at one, I think it was a Chicago area hospital, maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, they were having kind of a, a, a glitch that he was uh, asked to go address. What they were doing is when you were declared brain dead, they wanted the electronic medical record to stop you as a person at that point. So you were being unpersoned. And then now that you're a donor, they wanted to open a new medical record for you as kind of a bag of organs. So they're unpersoning people if you're declared brain dead. You no longer have legal rights in opening a new medical record for the bag of organs you are as a donor. So I looked at a lot of anesthesia articles, and I just bring this one up as, as representative. They're all pretty much like this. Um, this one talks about if you're having to care for an organ donor, how to take care of the blood pressure, the fluids, how to ventilate them, uh, if you need to give hormones, if you need blood transfused, to make sure that you get good oxygen to those organs. It talks about using the neuromuscular blockers. Those are paralyzing drugs to prevent movement during surgery. Does it surprise you to know that brain dead, dead people move during surgery? That's kind of upsetting to the operating room team. So you want to you know, be sure to paralyze them so they don't move. This article does not mention actual anesthesia. Not a word. Uh, that, this is the doctors uh, Miller and Truag that I mentioned earlier in their book. They reviewed the European anesthesia literature about whether, sh whether brain dead donors should be given anesthesia. And they found two responses. Uh, the first set was similar to what my uh, attending physician told me. Since brain dead patients retain some brain, brain functions, we cannot be sure that they don't feel pain during the harvest because after all, blood pressure and heart rate increase with incision. Therefore, an anesthetic should be given just to be on the safe side, right? Like my attending told me, just in case, right? Others disagreed. Surprisingly, their position was not based on the claim that these patients were incapable of experiencing pain. Instead, they were concerned that if the public learned that anesthesiologists were giving anesthetic to dead patients, 
It would make them suspicious that those pe people were not really dead. So honestly, you are at the mercy of whoever's on call for anesthesia that night, right? Are you going to get someone with half a heart or none, right? Author Dick Teresi wrote a book, you know, I think in 2013, called The Undead, about organ harvest. And he was, he's not a believer in Christ. He's a, he's a hard-hitting science writer. He came to the same conclusion, you know, these people are not dead. And he actually approached his local organ procurement organization and said, you know, if you can guarantee me that I will get an anesthetic, I will donate my organs. In fact, I will put a codicil in my will that says, that we will pay the anesthesiologist to give me an anesthetic. The OPO would give him no guarantee. Not, could, would not guarantee that. All right. If we are truly pro-life, we need to cherish and protect life from fertilization conception until natural death. You know, human beings, the teaching of the, of the church historically, we are a body-soul unity. When the God-given spirit departs from the body, that's when everything starts to break down. There is no one organ, not the brain, not the kidneys, not the heart. Our organs do not maintain our life. What maintains our life is that God-given spirit. Uh, and so until that spirit left, leaves, we are alive, biologically, physically, spiritually. Interestingly, if you look at a biology book, they have the same definition. A biology book at the bottom there defines death as the loss of integration of the organism as a whole. That happens when we have indwelling spirit. I mean, the brain, if you look at embryology, if your little you know, nice fetal models back there, the brain does not develop, I believe it's until four weeks, the little neural fold doesn't start. How could the brain be integrating itself? It's the God-given spirit that keeps us alive. So an, an ethical definition of death, I'm going to have to say we have to go back to the historical standard. When the, when the breathing and heartbeat stops, the spirit departs, the integrated, you know, of all our tissues working together begins to break down, that's when we're dead. Dr. R.A. Jaffe says, you know, we need to wait at least 10 minutes. And by 10 minutes, none of our organs are going to be able to be transplanted. And so, but this is, this is a consistent view of death with biological principles and spiritual principles. Organ donors are biologically and spiritually still alive. Even if the law has taken away their rights by declaring them legally dead, we can and must fight for them. So what can you do? You can refuse to be a registered organ donor. Okay, so if you register as an organ donor, that trumps, it supersedes your health care power of attorney, it supersedes your living will. If you have an organ registry uh, as a donor on your license, your organs will be taken um, regardless of the living will that you have or the desires of your family. Um, this leaves you helpless about, against being harvested while biologically alive. So we, we recommend, uh, don't sign a donor card. If you have signed a donor card, you can go down to the DMV, and in our state, a lady told me it cost her $14 to have one reissued. Um, sadly, this may not be enough, though. The, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act was revised in 2006. Um, it now says that if you do not wish to donate, you must explicitly state so. Here's the, the statute. They say since 2006, if, you're, if you get to the hospital and you're incapacitated, right, your family is not reasonably available and there is no documented evidence of your choice not to donate, the administrator of the hospital can make a gift of your body. Now, does the administrator of the hospital know you? Does he care about you? I don't know. Maybe, I maybe not. I mean, he certainly can make a lot of money off your organ. So this is putting someone whose who's vested interest may not be the same as yours in charge of your donation unless you have a documented evidence of a choice not to donate. So I looked at somebody's Georgia driver's license at the Faith and Medicine Conference. There is no, nothing on the Georgia license that says no. Thankfully, I live in Wisconsin. It says, am I an organ donor? Yes or no. So I have that on my license. But in Georgia, either you get a sticker or a yes or, or you've got nothing. And the nothing is not enough. 
So this is a, a card put out by the um, HALO people. There are some wonderful people who run a health uh, advocacy group based out of uh, Minnesota. They have put together this for you. It's called, uh, I refuse to be an organ donor. I have some on the back table. I think they're blue, the ones I have now. And they're, they're saying, you know what? Just sign this, get it witnessed. And they recommend you just, it folds around your driver's license. And that way when, when they come to check, you know, they can pull it out and see you're not. Um, Ricardo Davis uh, the other night also recommended if you're talking to your doctor, have him put it in the electronic medical record. I think that also be wise. Yeah, so this will protect you because it's a, it's a registered refusal. Not all transplants are bad, remember. Now you can, if you're in a position to do so, pray about and decide, you know, do you want to give a kidney to a family member? Uh, there are some amazingly altruistic people that do this for strangers. I have a nurse I used to work with that needed a kidney and someone just out of the goodness of her heart said, you know, I just want to give a kidney to someone. It's pretty amazing. Um, you can donate your tissues. You know, when you're all dead, your family knows you're all dead, but tell your family, you know, be sure your questions are answered first. Be sure, you know, it's not, there's not a lawsuit or a, you know, that you're happy and you're satisfied that you know why, why I died. Your questions are answered before doing this. We need to speak out against, you know, of course, Chinese forced organ harvesting, organ trafficking, brain dead, so-called organ harvest, especially the circulatory death organ harvest. Be prepared. It's good to know these things ahead of time um, because you're going to be approached in the most vulnerable day of your life by a team of people who, have, who do this for a living, that ask for organs for a living. And you know, I'm not here to say they're bad people, but their conscience is ill-informed, right? They have subscribed to a view of life and death, a worldview that allows removing organs from people who are still alive. I mean. I've heard doctors say, you know, the person he was isn't there anymore. As if a disabled person is no longer a person, right? But they're, they've justified it in their own minds. Um, just be ready to just sweetly, kindly say no, you know? That's, that's, it's good to be forewarned. All right, here's where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> what if you need a transplant? Okay, here in America, we've kind of got this idol. It's, I, I deserve to be happy and healthy all my life, right? But if what I'm telling you is true, you know, what kinds of transplants would be okay with you? <coughs> Some of them are ethical, right? We talked about the living donation, where both donor and recipient remain alive. We talked about the morgue donation. I mean, you need bone graft for your back surgery. If you need a cornea transplant, there's nothing wrong with that. What about people who need a heart transplant? You know, if we're gonna refuse a COVID shot because it was developed with the use of aborted fetal tissue, I mean, there was a murder involved in the development. How can we ethically think that I could take a heart transplant from someone who was, you know, dissected to death on that operating room table while still alive? Something to think about. I mean, this is where the rubber gets the road. I'm, I feel terrible that, you know, that people would die in need of a heart transplant. But you know, what about, the, what about, for every happy story of transplant like that, there's an untold story of someone else who died alone among strangers with maybe no anesthetic, right, being taken apart. Who speaks for them, right? I think if we hadn't been pouring all our research dollars into this current unethical system, we would have developed better treatments now, right? Either to augment the heart, support the heart medically, Artificial hearts, no one's really looking into that anymore. I mean, those things are not being developed because we're propping up this unethical system. And interestingly, this is an actuarial uh, table. The Millimans are an actuarial company. This, uh, the, over three, they, were, they come out every three years. So they compare 2017 to 2020, the one-year survival and the five-year survival. Interestingly, survival rates for all transplants were down in the last three years. You know, I, I can only speculate why that is. Uh, one reason I think that might be is that this quest for organs is allowing way less suitable people to be, you know, organs to be donated. Right now, they are taking organs from AIDS people, people with AIDS, 
thinking that, well, at least we've got the organ, we can put that in you and then we'll treat you for AIDS, right? Um, there, there was a proposal I saw last week in the state of Massachusetts. They were gonna offer prisoners a year off their sentence if they donate a kidney or donate bone marrow. I mean, I, I like people in all walks of life, but I don't think a lot of prisoners have cared for their body as well as, as you'd want them to. I mean, so I think just the, the, the organs that are being kind of gathered in aren't as good a quality as they have been in years past is how I would, would explain that. Anyway, the ends don't justify the means. This is a, from an ethicist, Dr. Michael Nair Collins, appealing to the good consequences of organ transplantation in an attempt to justify the lack of transparency if not the outright obfuscation on which the transplant enterprise rests is not a very compelling argument. Again, I want to extend Christ's mercy and forgiveness to all of us in this nation. I mean, we need to repent about so many things, don't we? But the transplant industry has existed for over 50 years. I mean, I've talked to someone who gave a beloved brother, not knowing. I get email, the hard email. Dr. Plessy, you've just rocked my world. Everyone told me that, you know, I was so wonderful that I got that heart transplant. And now you're telling me that it came from a murder victim. Am I, did I cheat God? Do I deserve to be alive? The answer is yes. God loves you. God, in his um, un, inscrutable judgment, allowed you to be alive. What are we here for? We're here to love him. We're here to serve him. Your life is valuable. It's not your fault they didn't tell you these things. So it's a, it's a message of reconciliation as well. Because, you know, I'm one of these people. I cannot throw stones at anybody. I'm here to tell you that, that mercy and forgiveness are here for all. So again, our website, the card is in the back, respectforhumanlife.com. Our book is in the back, available on Amazon. All right, here's a, I know it's been long, but I'm gonna give you just a quick end, the quick bonus, the new thing, the revisions to the UDDA. American Academy of Neurology has proposed some revision. Change one, they wanna replace the term irreversible with permanent. Now that doesn't sound like a big change, but the term permanent means we are not gonna to try to fix the problem. So it's permanent. So if I had a drowning man out there in the, you know, in the lake and I decided not to save him, he's permanently dead. He's dead already, in fact. That's what the permanent means, right? So if you are ill, they're going to get rid of irreversible and they're going to make it permanent because no effort will be made to help or save you. Change two. They want, we've talked about the UDDA. It's supposed to be the entire brain. They want to just make it the brain stem. And I couldn't even find a picture of the brain stem. That's the brain stem and the spinal cord in orange. So really the top three inches are the brain stem. So they want to change it so just if that three inches of you isn't working right, you can be declared dead. And, and that only will be the bedside testing. That won't be the EEGs like this, right? Um, and it won't be cerebral perfusion scans. They want to standardize the brain stem testing protocol. Interestingly, currently, Every hospital can determine brain death any way it wants right now. There's no universal standard, which has made it easier for attorneys when, you, when someone wants to challenge a brain death diagnosis, the attorneys can say, well, you know, in the next state, they do these tests. You didn't do those. And it makes it easier for families to win lawsuits. They want to take away that by making it a blanket way of checking this across the United States. They want, this is the, probably the worst one to me. They want to eliminate the need for consent prior to brain death testing. So families can no longer say, no, I don't want my, my loved one to undergo that. They can test it without your consent. And the reason that's a problem is that one of the tests disconnects you from your ventilator to see if you will breathe for six to eight to 10 minutes. So if you have someone who already has an injured brain and now you don't breathe for them for up to 10 minutes, that's only going to cause the brain damage to get worse. There is nothing that test does for you as a person. It can only make you worse, and they're going to take away your right to refuse that. That, I think, is a big problem. So what they're trying to do is they want to remove the ability for families to refuse a brain death determination 
and make it more difficult for them to sue after it has been given. So I think, again, this is something, I'm an observer for the Uniform Law Commission. I'm gonna be logging in this weekend. They're meeting Friday and Saturday. And I get to watch and find out what they're doing. You know, what? some of the things that are encouraging is there, there are people pushing back. And so I saw this week the Catholic Medical Association wrote a letter to the Uniform Law Commission about this, praise the Lord. But where's the Protestant church? <laughs> and this is the hard part. Yeah. And, and I understand it's harder because the Protestant church is so dispersed, right? We're all individual churches and, and governing bodies and units. And, and it does help us. It makes us you know, less likely to get heresy straight down from the Vatican. But, but we're so dispersed. It's very <laughs> difficult for your pastor to know all of this. So please take it and show it to your pastor. Um, I was very encouraged that the G3 Ministries invited me to write that article, and in the article I do make a plea to pastors and theologians. The Uniform Law Commissions, I actually got connected with one of the commissioners, and I asked him what would be the most helpful thing for the church to do, and he said, you know, I said, should we do like an email campaign? And he said, you know, they, they, they would see that as political, it would probably just be counterproductive, but what would probably help. He said what they would actually like is if, if you're an expert, they would like expert opinions. And if you know your pastor is a theologian, I mean, if your pastor is a pastor, he's supposed to be an expert on life and death, right? So I'm, 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 I'm just putting that out there. It's on the article. It's on my website. On the website, there's the link to the you know, Uniform Law Commission. So if you pick up that article, it, it's from the G3 Ministries. You can see it there. You can see it on my website, and there are active links. So if you want to, if someone wanted to write a letter to the Uniform Law Commission as an expert, offering expert opinion, it would be welcome. <coughs> I'd like to finish you know, with just a little bit of a thank you. Dr. Paul Byrne, some of you know who he is. He has been speaking out about this since 1975. You know, God bless his heart. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I'm not the first person, and I hope hopefully will not be the last to talk about this, but you know, people who have been laboring in this field all those years, praise the Lord for them. And I think I've come to the end. So thank you again wow. for sitting through all that. I know it was a lot. I would appreciate any questions or feedback. Yes.